Temple University. This is Profiles in Literature, featuring interviews with authors and illustrators prominent in American literature for children. The moderator for this series is Dr. Jacqueline N. Schachter, Professor of Children's Literature with Temple University. It's good to meet a couple who share common professional interests, like today's guest, Lynn Ward, primarily known as an artist, and his wife, Mae McNear, author mainly of children's nonfiction. I'm Jacqueline Schachter, a professor of children's literature at Temple University. And this is Carolyn Field, director of the Office on Work with Children of the Free Library of Philadelphia and co-sponsor of our series of videotapes with outstanding children's authors and illustrators. I think this college audience would appreciate knowing that Columbia University played Cupid to Mae McNear, who was born in Florida and went to the University of Georgia School of Journalism, and Lynn Ward, who was raised in Chicago as the son of a Methodist minister and professor. How did you two wind up at Columbia? Well, we met on a blind date. And uh, we didn't know it at the time. We did something that was most unusual. For that time, nowadays it would not be. We married the week we left Columbia. And um, I didn't know it. But I was getting myself a very good illustrator. <laughs> <laughs> you bought. <laughs> this was Your entirely artist. unknown at the I time, see. but that's the way it worked out. Well, I shouldn't have said bought. You hooked your artist. <laughs> I hooked one, yes. Uh -huh. And shortly after your marriage, didn't you go to Germany to study? Yes, we left for Germany the week, in fact, the night we were married. And uh, we went there because, my, because Lynn wanted to study uh, graphic art, wood engraving and lithography and so on. And at that time, he couldn't learn that in this country. And uh, so we went to Leipzig, Germany, and we stayed there nearly a year so that he could get his training in these techniques. Well, we're going to see more of those techniques in a few minutes. The Biggest Bear, written and illustrated by Lynn Ward, won him the Caldecott Medal in 1953. In a moment, we'll see a close-up of that coveted metal. Here are two illustrations. Just a minute, we'll be seeing them from The Biggest Bear. Can you tell us what medium you used, Mr. Ward? Well, The Biggest Bear, as so many of my other books, has used a medium that can only be described as opaque watercolor, which means that instead of uh, being transparent the way ordinary watercolor is, when you lay down a area with opaque watercolor, it hides whatever is underneath it, underneath it. And this is the quality of the opaque watercolor that makes it so in invaluable a medium as far as my own approach to illustration is concerned, because the necessity of changing things as I go along, of developing an area beyond what it it appears when it's first laid in is very uh, much a part of the way of working with opaque watercolor and for that reason I find it quite invaluable. I have here the bearskin covered copy of The Biggest Bear, specially prepared by the publisher. How many copies were printed of this? It's probably the most limited edition in the world. There are only two copies of it. <laughs> and uh, it is the only book that our dog really took an interest in. <laughs> I'll tell you the truth. Before um, we began today, Miss McNear was cleaning it off, shaking out all the dandruff. <laughs> it requires uh, moth treatment just like a fur coat. Oh, though. really? <laughs> Uh, the rest of the illustrations that we'll be showing are for books where the artist was Lynn Ward, but the writer was Mae McNear. Tell us the title and the medium you use. This is from My Friend Mac, the story of Little Baptiste and the, the moose. And it, it's a detail of that showing l the little boy's father and the growing moose. The technique is uh, a black and white drawing with a second color added, both of them done in black, but when printed, 
becoming a two-color illustration. The next, this is a detail of uh, America's Abraham Lincoln, and in which the full pages and spreads were done in full color, which we do not see here. But again, the medium was opaque watercolor. Next. <coughs> this is Florence Nightingale, the English uh, nurse who became well known during the Crimean War for her treatment of the wounded from a book by May called Armed with Courage. Again, opaque watercolor. Next. Portrait of Marian Anderson from an another book by May. Uh, this one, Give Me Freedom. Again, the medium is opaque watercolor. Next. A four color lithograph in which the drawing was done with the lithographic crayon on stone and then transferred to a printing, a, a printing plate so that it could be run in a high-speed press, each color being drawn separately with crayon. And then when the four printed together, you get the effect of full color. Next. And Quotemoc from the Mexican story, the Quotemoc, of course, the leader of the Aztecs in their uh, unhappy war waged to preserve their freedom from the Spanish. I think that finishes up the several slides that we have of techniques. I have a copy here of the Silver Pony, Mr. Ward's 1953 magnificent story without words. What was the medium you used? Well, it at the cost of sounding repetitive, I'll have to admit that this too was done in opaque watercolor. And I think that in a story of this kind in which a tremendous variety of subject matter has to be rendered, the qualities that opaque watercolor offers you are most effective in the variety of things that have to be done with it. We have some illustrations that you've done. Wonder if you could tell us the medium you used for each. This, uh, this is from America's Mark Twain and, include, and represents one of the incidents from Tom, so Tom Sawyer that May has included in that biography of our, one of our favorite writers. The drawing is a simple black and white drawing similar to what most uh, people would probably render with a, pain, a pen, but which in uh, because of uh, my own particular bent towards the use of a brush, I have worked with a, a small watercolor brush that will render a line that is as fine as that of any pen, but also has the capacity of filling in larger dark areas uh, very easily and with the, uh, the variety of textures that uh, some of the pen work does not offer. Next. A rough for the jacket of a, a little story about the part of New Jersey we live in. This was done in color. There was a gray in which the wolf was rendered, and then there, and then there was a red and a blue that were used for in parts of the other, other parts of the picture. Next. Another st part of the story of the wolf of Lamb's Lane. Here the uh, Medium, again, is opaque watercolor. Next. Uh, opaque watercolor, this is a scene from May's story about uh, southern New Jersey of 100 years ago called Stranger in the Pines. Next. And from that same book, the same medium. Next. And this is a larger uh, part of that story, of that uh, one from the story of the biggest bear, and which shows you some of the uh, other things that go on in a picture, that is, you have the main element in a picture, but beyond that, there are other things that have to be indicated, and each of them contributes to the whole, such as the uh, pattern of the wings of the gulls leading back to and developing the circular motion that starts up from the upraised bow of the boat. 
with the island towards which they are going is seen in the far distance. Next. This is uh, one of the drawings from The Silver Pony, and again, opaque watercolor. Next. From The Silver Pony, the same medium, of course. Incidentally, parts of, the, of that picture may show some of the textures that are possible through the use of, of a sponge instead of a brush, through uh, working with a, a sponge to apply the color in the uh, uncontrolled and uh, accidental patterns that result from the uh, way the sponge happens to be formed. Next. A color lithograph from the Mexican story. Again, f four separate drawings, which when printed together will combine to give a, the effect of full color. This subject, of course, is Cortez, the conqueror of Mexico, the destroyer of the Aztec civilization, and a man who is remembered in Mexico only by the fact that the Mexicans have, on all of these hundreds of years, have refused to have a single statue to Cortez anywhere within their land, for, for reasons that I think any, any of us can well understand. Next. And here, uh, from the Canadian story, a companion book to the Mexican story, a lithograph in four colors. This, the subject, a, 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 an English lad named Kelsey, who was the first white man to see the American buffalo on its native range in the far western prairies. I think that brings us to the end of the, of the lithographic sequence. Um, Mr. Ward is a master lithographer. In fact, he brought a lithography stone with him, and I've asked him to please explain the lithography process to us. Well, lithography, as some of you may have uh, heard, is of all the three major graphic processes, the most recent in its development. Uh, but it uh, came about in a rather accidental way because there was a young actor, playwright in Bavaria towards the end of the 18th century who wanted to have his plays printed and couldn't afford them to have it done commercially. So he set about trying to find some way in which he could write on metal and then etch away the surrounding metal and then print from the plate that uh, resulted. But he, to, to, uh, to gr uh, grind his colors and roll out his ink, he had made use of a piece of the native limestone that was prevalent in the part of Germany in which he lived. And then one day he discovered, quite by accident, that if he dampened the stone and rolled it over with uh, ink that, uh, that was on a roller, Wherever the stone was damp, which is where no drawing had been done, the uh, stone would, was slightly receptive to water and would soak in and become water sensitive, whereas the part of the stone that had been hidden underneath the crayon was sensitive not to water but only to grease. So if he used a greasy ink, he found that he could just dampen the stone and without any change in height, just the surface remaining exactly the same height throughout the area, that those parts where he had drawn with crayon uh, would not would take the ink, and no ink would be picked up by the rest of the stone. And then if he put this stone in a press and with a piece of paper on it and ran it through the press, that he would have a print on paper. And then he could dampen the stone again, roll it up again with, with ink, and make another print. And, so, and from that little... Uh, f from that essential, essentially small beginning, the whole art of lithography as an artist medium developed, and subsequently in our own time, the uh, offset printing process was developed, which really, the offset printing merely means that the basic things that happen in lithography are transferred to a piece of metal that will go in a high-speed press. Now, the amazing thing about the lithographic process is the accidental quality of it. It's almost as if somehow it had been willed that this way of printing would be discovered. And it utilizes only a very simple piece of, uh, of uh, a stick of 
of uh, crayon, black crayon, or a pencil. This is the same material, but in, put in pencil form for greater ease in doing, making certain parts of a drawing. Now, e each of the black uh, substances here of which the pencil or the crayon are composed is primarily a greasy material that has a certain amount of black in it. The black does not function in terms of the process, but just enables you to see what, where you're laying down, in effect, grease. So what the artist does is to take these uh, crayons and draw directly on the stone. If we could see that uh, stone again, I think you will see that the, the uh, areas on which are, have been completed, the stone has on it an unfinished drawing, that the areas that have been drawn there are look to, as if they just had been drawn with crayon, which in effect they have. And they, where you bear down heavily with the crayon, you increase the size of the, of the uh, crayon stroke and you fill in the stone more completely so that it becomes a solid black where you draw very lightly with the crayon. You lay down only a slight amount of the, of the greasy crayon and that then gives the effect of a gray because the eye mi mixes tiny dots of, of black and tiny dots of white to create a middle tone. And that essentially is what lithography is all about and what offset printing is all about. And I said that it was uh, almost as if it had been foreordained that this would be discovered at some time because the uh, young actor or playwright in Germany who invented lithography uh, was not interested in making something that would become a new way of printing with the tremendous usability that it has so that now most printing in all over the world is done through offset lithography. But uh, he was interested only in solving his own immediate problem. And he happened to live in a part of Germany where sans uh, limestone was readily available. As a matter of fact, great quarries still exist there. But the fact of the matter is that only that particular limestone has the capacity to absorb water and grease slightly in, into its surface and thus is usable from the point of view of a medium that depends upon the mutual antagonism between oil, uh, between grease and water. And of the limestone that is found in that part of Germany, only 10% of it has this quality and can therefore be used. And although all of, in all of the world, limestone is probably the most frequently found stone of any, it is no, in no other part of the world has there been found any limestone that has this particular ability to absorb slightly grease and water. So that it is almost as if it was a, a de determined thing way in advance that uh, this particular young actor or playwright would hit upon the, the process at a place where so few uh, other kinds of, of stone were available and the, that this particular stone was the one that he was searching for. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ward, you've had a three-pronged art career. Uh, illustrating children's books, adult books, and doing wood engravings. Uh, can you tell me, please, if it is a wood engraving print of yours that's hanging in the Smithsonian? Well, I, I haven't been to the Smithsonian, but I do know that some years ago they asked me to provide them with an exhibit on wood engraving in which I, so that I gave them a seat series in which uh, I had taken a a drawing that I made of a landscape subject and developed it into a into a finished uh, engraving and I uh, pulled proofs of it so that if that is the one that they have it shows the rough sketch it so it shows the engraved block and it shows the proof that finally resulted from it. Here is an example of a wood engraving from Mr. Ward's one of Mr. Ward's illustrations for a book by Miss McNear, Waif Made. Uh, I understand that you are doing a painting that will be on exhibit, a traveling exhibit for the Bicentennial. Can you tell us 
what the subject of that is and what medium you're using? Well, the, uh, the National Park Service, which, has, uh, admi which administers all of the national parks all over the country, has commissioned a number of artists to work on paintings that will show the relationship between that particular park and the events of, that are being celebrated in the bicentennial. And my uh, commission is, was for a, a, a painting based on the Battle of Moores Creek, which most of us have probably not heard of. It was a very small skirmish in, in the early years of the uh, series of events that led towards uh, the July 4th event that was so significant, particularly for Philadelphians. But this uh, little skirmish took place in North Carolina, and uh, it involved a bridge, and it involved local, uh, local militia who were not Minutemen, but were certainly s cousins of the Minutemen of the Long Concord and Lexington uh, area who played the, a part in the events in New England. And the reason that Moore's Creek is, continues to be of importance is that many historians feel that if the Loyalists had won at Moore's Creek and had not been repulsed and driven back, that the whole uh, group of colonies from Virginia on down would have been lost to the American cause. And uh, that would have resulted in a far different uh, outcome for the whole of the revolution. So Did it is you use within, oil for that? Uh, I used uh, casein. Uh, we have a citation and two silver medallions that were presented by the University of Southern Mississippi. The medallions to Mr. Ward and the citation to Ms. McNear in the spring of last year. Ms. <coughs> McNear, tell us what was the occasion. Well, it was a children's book festival, and um, it was related to the very large and impressive collection of children's book illustrations and manuscripts that the University of Southern Mississippi has collected. They uh, were among the first to do this, and they have uh, put a great deal of interest into it. So they have quite a, a very nice uh, festival in the spring every year. And this, we happen to be the ones that, who were honored last spring. Why, Miss McNear, we're going to focus on you for the balance. Uh, why is it that you have given so much attention to historical events and figures? Well, I've always been interested in history. I started reading history when I was a very small girl and practically lived in a large bookcase in Tampa, Florida. <laughs> that was my home, I think. And it was filled mainly with history books, and I read history books and liked them. I find it very difficult to bring myself up to date. Um, <laughs> I, you see, I'm a fourth generation Floridian, like the alligators, and I think like the alligators, I stem from the, the uh, early past, uh, the late, the late uh, world of books is a little strange to me. I've crept up on it somewhat in recent years, but I haven't yet reached 1974. Uh, I'll tell you one of your books that's a favorite of mine. It's called The Stranger in the Pines. We saw two of the drawings from it. Uh, it's a 1972 yes. copyright date, yes. I believe. Why did you lay it, why did you set it in the New Jersey Pine Barrens? Well, that's a book of fiction, a full-length book of fiction. And I had uh, decided that I wanted to write fiction. Having written so much nonfiction, and only an occasional book of fiction in the past. I, I became very interested in the Pine Barren country of South Jersey, which is a unique area. And I hope it's going to be preserved. I don't know, but I hope so, because it's like nothing else in the country. And it has, there are plants there that grow nowhere else in the world. And I became interested in the history of it. Uh, it dates from early times. And that is where the bog iron in the ground, in the streams, was used in the, and made in the furnace towns into weapons for the American Revolution. Well, I picked 1830 as a time to write the story of a boy who ran away from Philadelphia and uh, escaped into the Pine Barrens and 
was lost and had various adventures in the Pine Barrens. And I picked 1830 because I'd written so much nonfiction about battles and wars that I decided I must have a time in which there was no war. And this, this worked out very well for that and for other reasons, mainly because that was also a time when the furnace towns were in full blast in the Pine Barrens. Later, they went out of existence because of the introduction of uh, anthracite coal in Pennsylvania into the making of steel and iron products, so that this, uh, in the Pine Barrens, they could not compete with it because there they used only charcoal, which they also made in the, in the Pine Barrens as the fuel. Uh, is the character <coughs> of Dr. Micah in that book patterned after Dr. James Still, yes, uh, that's I wonder if people know he was the famous. He was born in New Jersey in 1812. He was a black uh, a person who treated people primarily with herbs. Yes, that's true. And He's very advanced. A, he, that is the only real character I used. I changed his name because, for the purposes of the story, I had to make some changes in his circumstances. But that really was the man who was known as the Black Doctor of the Pines. And he was very well known and very much loved. And in fact, even in the present generation in the Pines, people still know and talk of, of the Black Doctor, who was really an herb doctor. Do you plan, as I hope, <laughs> do you plan to do more children's uh, fiction, historical fiction? Yes, I'm working on one now. In fact, I'm on the fifth rewrite. And how many more rewrites there'll be, I couldn't say. At this stage, um, it's anybody's guess. But this is entirely different. When I write a book, I can't make use of the same material in the next book. If I could, it would save me a great deal of time and hard work. But I have to sweat it out then on a new subject, which I have to learn about, and starting from scratch. However, this present um, story is about my home area in Florida in the 1920s, 1926, five, when I was at Columbia. So that um, that's the boom time in Florida. And I did work on a newspaper there in the summers. And this is about a newspaper girl in Florida. Boom. It's your turn, Carolyn Fields. Oh, <laughs> lovely, lovely. Uh, there are so many questions I want to ask. I don't know where to begin. But I will say, first of all, we're very proud at the Free Library of Philadelphia to have so many of your original illustrations, Ritland Ward, particularly the portraits from Armed with Courage, which we have framed and are hung in many of our branch libraries and at Central and so on. And I'm interested, in, since you two work together, per se, how do you uh, select the characters that you would put in these books uh, armed with courage, we'll say May McNear, and uh, do you do it alone, or do you work with uh, Lynn Ward on selecting them, and so forth and so on? Well, the way we work together varies with a different type of book, of course. With a book of fiction, um, I write the book and finish it and have it accepted by the publisher before he starts on it. Then when I get the galley proof, I correct one set, and he takes the other set and starts working on the illustrations. But with a book such as Arm with Courage, where we start from the beginning, working together, we have to plan the book together, mm -hmm. because it has a great many pictures and a short text, so that we discuss the, the book, we decide we want to do it, and what we want to do, and then we decide on the characters that we want in it, with a, a book of different biographies by talking it over, but it's on the basis of some women as well as some men, mm -hmm. and in a different period covering, say, a hundred years, and different types of people, and different races, and different religions. We tried to make it as comprehensive as we could. And so then after that, I research it and write it, and then he does the illustrations. Well, now, do you go to the publisher with your uh, ideas and they accept it, or do you write the book and then take it to the publisher? Well, if it's like a that? book of fiction, I never approach the publisher until I've finished it because I never know how long it'll take, mm -hmm. and I don't want a deadline with a book of fiction. It makes mm -hmm. me nervous. With nonfiction, uh, we do approach the publisher ahead of time and say, we would like to do such and such a book. Are you interested? And then the publisher says, yes, hopefully, and then we do it. 
Thank you very, very much. Uh, in closing, I would like to say that Ms. McNear's Armed with Courage won the 1958 award from the Thomas Alva Edison Society for uh, its distinguished contributions to developing character in children. And Mr. Ward is a past president of the American Society of Graphic Artists. He was also New Jersey Artist of the Year in 1963. He's illustrated many, many famous books, including a Newbery Medal winner by Coatsworth, The Cat Who Went to Heaven. It's been a pleasure having you as our guest. We've enjoyed it.